So, as was foreshadowed yesterday several times by Matt, we have Lorenz talking more about Cloudflare and how they're doing their things. Exactly. So the pressure's on. Hello. Yeah. Better. Great. Okay. So the pressure's on. Um, I'm Lawrence. I work as a systems engineer for, uh, for Cloudflare. I'm a colleague of Matt's. Um, I'm going to be talking about Quicksilver, which is an internal project we have, um, and how we integrated that with uh, the Prometheus, Prometheus setup that um, Matt uh, talked about yesterday. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about what Quicksilver is and how it works. I'm going to talk about the two most interesting metrics, I think, and how they use um, Prometheus histograms to give us a lot of insight into how the system is working. Um, and then I'm going to talk about all of the gotchas that um, we encountered while doing this work. Without further, that worked. One second, sorry. Without further ado, you've seen this. Um, I'll just point you to the blog, uh, which usually has interesting technical stuff, so I advise you to check it out. Um, now, what is Quicksilver? Um, it's an internal system that we use to provision configuration information from our, that our customers create to um, our edge. So this is the 110 data centers that you've seen yesterday. It is what I would call a replicated database, and I'll uh, go into a bit of detail why I call it replicated versus something else. Um, it runs on a few thousand machines. Um, it's written in Go. I always forget saying that. Um, and it's a team of three working on it, my colleagues Joffrey and Sami, also in the London office. So what is Quicksilver? Obviously, I need a world map now because it's such a great system, um, or large, I should say. At any point in time, there's a single what we call root node in Quicksilver. Uh, and this root node um, serializes and kind of orchestrates all writes to the system. And it takes the data that is written to the system, puts it in a, in a log entry, puts a timestamp on it. Um, and then it forwards that data on to other nodes, which we call the followers, which are spread all over the globe. Um, and how that is configured isn't always under our control, and uh, most of the time, Mr. E will kind of uh, work on that. Um, and we can also have a second tier of nodes, uh, which do not get that data from the root node, but they get data from a different node, so there's an intermediate step. The whole thing is, is basically a tree um, or a directed acyclic graph, if you're into that, uh, means we don't have any loops uh, and there's a single source of truth. And then there's loads more of these. Now, why is this replicated and not distributed? Um, I call it replicated because there's actually no guarantee about when data becomes visible at any uh, data center that we have. Um, this is because we don't, we have a lot of data centers. Some of them are in uh, parts of the world that have, at times, very bad internet connectivity. Uh, and we do not want a single data center to impact the service to other data centers, obviously. So this, in effect, means that um, any config change that a customer makes um, has an unbounded time that it can take to get to any particular color. What we have to do is, because we don't want our customers to basically tweet at us and say, oh, actually, two hours ago I made that change, nothing's happened, what's going on? We need to be able to monitor this. Um, and the way we're doing it is by using a metric that we call the replication lag. So let's say we have um, our root node in the US, um, we have some an, an, another node in southern Europe, and we have one in South Africa. So what we do is that we measure the time it takes for a what we call the log entry, which is the, this packet of data that the root node creates, for log entry to go from the root node to the kind of the end node, the, the data center, so to speak. Um, we do this by um, comparing local time. So there's issues with clock skew, but usually it works out fine. So let's say from the US to Southern Europe, it takes 450 milliseconds. Um, to Southern Africa, it takes 600 milliseconds. And this gives us a very good idea of what the current quality of services we provide to the users of, of our system. 
because we take these measurements and we put them into a Prometheus histogram. Um, every, single of, every single machine that runs this service um, exports the Prometheus histogram. And using the um, Prometheus setup that my colleague Matt described yesterday, we aggregate and federate them at the colo level and then put them into a global Prometheus that we use to query uh, and visualize global um, or this data globally. This is what it looks like. Um, I'm very much looking forward to Grafana supporting histograms uh, in its dashboard. That's going to be super cool to see. Um, this is the histogram quantile function with a P99 um, applied to the raw data that I just talked about. Um, so you'll see, um, we can kind of visually see that most of the time, you know, um, we're actually below sec 10 seconds of global propagation. Um, something weird happened. Seems like the global propagation went up. So maybe that's something that we need to look into. And that weird red spike on the left is something I'll get to later. Now, in reality, we lack information in this system because the only thing I can tell you by looking at my metrics is uh, actually South Africa is, is too slow, 600 milliseconds. You know, arbitrarily, we've decided that is not fast enough. Um, I, I don't actually know what the route is that the data takes. I don't have any control over it. I can't attach that metadata to Prometheus because we get a cardinality explosion. Um, integrating that into a protocol would probably be too difficult because we kind of have to shuttle metadata around. Um, but it's a real problem because I can see some data center of ours is, is lagging behind, but I don't actually know where in that chain in the tree I kind of need to tweak the settings to make sure that um, speed increases. So the second thing, or the second metric that we came up with is again a histogram. And it works very similar to the replication lag that I've been talking about. But instead of measuring the time it takes between the root node and kind of the individual nodes, we just time what it takes for our, um, we call them log entries, to traverse a single network hop. And we put that in a, in a histogram. So for the first case, the, the timing stays the same. Yeah? From the US to uh, Southern Europe, it's still 450 milliseconds because it uh, is just a single hop. Um, so replication lag and network lag is the same. But if we then look at um, going from Europe to Africa, we can see actually this is 150 milliseconds. So that's not that bad. Um, this link is probably acceptable for the distance it travels. But really, what we want to be looking at is the 450 milliseconds that we're spending in getting to Europe. And when you put that on a world map, it looks like this. So these are all of our pops that we have, or data centers, all over the world, um, using the histogram quantile aggregated by the colo, or the data center. And then you can see that you know the big red circles, right in the screenshot there in Moscow and Montreal. Um, these experience what we call the network lag. So we could go in and say, OK, what's going on with the network? Do you need to change something? Is there congestion, et cetera, et cetera. And this uh, gives us as developers um, a lot of evidence that we can give to uh, our ops people and say, actually, look at this. You can, there's something wrong. Can you have a look? So combine these two are, I think, what really made us embrace uh, Prometheus. I don't think. Um, I don't know if any other solution that would have allowed us to kind of get this amount of insight into the system that we're running. Um, so this is very, very useful to us. Um, now, having spoken about that, I'd like to go into all of the issues that we encountered when, when we were setting the system up. So number one is uh, the alert cascade. And just from the title, you can tell that this is not good news. Um, it turns out that when you set up a system that looks like a tree, um, if you have and you set up alerts on it, um, it's going to mean that if there's a problem very high up in the tree, let's say hypothetically the root node goes down or something like that, um, you end up generating a lot of alerts everywhere in that tree. Uh, and this is the, the one time when we I think we're generating 7,000 alerts at a particular time. Uh, the, Annoying bit is that these alerts were tied to PagerDuty, 
Uh, uh, Matt informed me yesterday that luckily they were deduplicated by alert managers. So thank you very much for that, but they still broke the iPhones of our SREs, which crashed and then we started. <laughs> um, so what do we do about this? Uh, the solution for this is inhibition. So we set up rules that kind of say if something is going on very close to the root of the tree, don't bother alerting, don't send me the other alerts, I just want to know about this single thing, um, ops personnel, we can concentrate on fixing it, um, and it works. It works with caveats, so the way to get there was a bit uh, rough. So inhibition, oh my. Um, this alert that went off looks something like this, and this is an alert manager inhibition rule. Um, I'm skipping some details, but it's not relevant. So let's just say the alert is called no heartbeat received. And uh, I'll point out that this is uh, according to Matt's standards, the naming of the alert, um, it's very descriptive. So no heartbeat received means that it's kind of an end-to-end -end test that we have. Every few seconds we write a sp specific value to a database, and then on the edge we check what's the value, what's the timestamp, how much out of date is it. And this is a useful alert because it catches a wide range of issues from misconfiguration to, you know, some servers going down, etc. cetera. Um, but it's also very unhelpful because if it fires, you just know something is wrong. Um, you don't know what is wrong. And we have a lot of other alerts that are actually much more suited to tell our ops people or tell ourselves what to do, right? So we have plenty of alerts which are quite specific and tell us what the problem is and how to remedy it. We have this one alert, which is not very specific, but it still keeps popping up. So what we want to do in this inhibition rule is we say, suppress this heartbeat received alert if any other alert is running. Now, what happens when you run this through alert manager, and I found this out the hard way, is uh, this inhibits itself. <laughs> Um, I'd like to point out that this is uh, is the issue of the beast on the alert manager <laughs> repository. Um, so my, my kind of uh, corollary from this is that inhibition is definitely comes with sharp edges included. I think it's hard to get right. Um, it feels like the way inhibition works is a consequence of the implementation. So when you understand how inhibition is implemented in alert manager, it makes perfect sense but kind of when you uh, approach it from the um, kind of view of somebody who reads the documentation, it's not clear. I've put in a pull request which now says don't do this, but we'll see. Now, the next one is a pet peeve of mine, um, and I've bothered my uh, Matt about this a lot, which is that um, aggregated histograms are buggy. So I want to show this visually, so we take um, Histograms on, this is one data center. Um, there's a lot of machines which expose a histogram. Um, and the, the query isn't very useful usually, but what it's supposed to show you is that visually you can tell there's no sample that is higher than five seconds in this colon for this particular time span. Now, when I aggregate this, it looks like that. So all of a sudden I get these weird, weird spikes and they go to five minutes and 20 seconds which is the highest bucket that we've configured. And um, apparently this is, as, as far as I understand this, uh, this is due to um, the atomicity problems that the current Prometheus version has. So we're still on 1.6.2. So maybe that's been fixed, I don't know. Um, so apparently this is due to the atomicity issues um, Prometheus currently has. Um, but, it has been much improved by APR, recent one, which kind of fudges the histogram as far as I understand it. Uh, and I think it's fixed in 2.0. Nope. Okay. It's good to know. Um, maybe we can put in a PR. And I think there might be more problems to come with histograms because they're A, incredibly useful, but they're B, the most complicated um, metric that Prometheus has to offer. So it's they're kind of this this weird unicorn and how they're implemented at the Prometheus level um, and also getting the implementation in the client libraries right is actually hard. Now, <coughs> federation and high availability. This is not a dream team. 
Um, what happens is in our setup that the, the kind of this global Prometheus that we have, which we use to, to query the status of all of our colors, which has federated uh, and aggregated data in it, will end up with multiple scrapes per individual machine. So if I just run a naive query against it, I'll, I'll kind of have double results in it. Okay. Just continue. So what I have to do is I have to deduplicate these queries, or I have to deduplicate these scrapes in my queries. I somehow need to figure out how to take only a single scrape uh, in my query. Uh, and how to do that, uh, I think, depends on your metric. Um, I've tried to figure it out for uh, histograms. It took me like three tries, and probably it's still wrong, but I'll still show you what I've come up with. Um, which looks roughly like this. So you have the regular old histogram quantile. Uh, you sum by whatever you're interested in. So this is your aggregation function. But then you take um, the max, and this could also be the min, um, I think, uh, and you strip out the common labels. And what the max does is basically chooses one consistent scrape. Um, and why this works is, uh, why this works depends on how um, histograms are implemented in Prometheus. I would be really interested in if this is correct or not, and maybe we can talk about this in the questions. Now, Sneha mentioned this already, so I'll skip it probably, but very briefly, service discovery um, and the up metric is not a friend because the sum of something that's absent is also absent. So anytime you do this, you also need to alert on the fact that something is absent. In summary, I think Prometheus is the best choice for us. Um, it's amazing and the visibility has given us into the system that we've built. Um, PromQL, I think, deserves higher praise. I think it's probably the single most, or the single biggest feature for me because it's such an such a nice way to kind of access your data. And it's such a nice way to get other people to draw them in and say, look, you can, you can actually write a query against your metrics data, which is amazing. I think inhibition needs love. Uh, if not from documentation, you need to figure out whether this is a good mental model of how it's supposed to work. And finally, querying federated High availability Prometheus requires extra care. This is worded very um, delicately. Um, I think this kind of, the, I know that the use case is uh, not very common. Uh, There's probably not that many people running this specific setup. Um, but it feels like there could be a much better story here um, in how Prometheus handles this or how, how the work I have to do as somebody who writes alerts and looks at metrics um, rather than what it is today. And that's it for me. I um, love any questions. So to answer your question, move the max to the app to be last. Because I haven't run the math, but you probably want that on the outside, rather okay. than the inside. Otherwise, you'll have the same problems again with his term quantile. So max after the sum. So after, sum. His, after his term quantile. Uh, OK. I have to write another blog post to convince myself it works. <laughs> okay. So, questions? Put your hands up. Ooh. You really want an early break, don't you? <laughs> it's exciting. Oh, there's one. Um, so instead of scraping both HA servers, have you thought about, and like, I've been thinking about it, but I haven't done it yet, um, just putting some proxy in front that just picks one Prometheus or the other to scrape from? Um, yes, I think so Matt is working on that stuff. Uh, that probably will suffer from a similar problem that you want your scraper to be highly available. So all of a sudden you then need to figure out how do you make that thing highly available without support, having that support in Prometheus. Uh, there's so also semantic problems there. Yes, probably. I, uh, I've uh, been having a couple of hallway conversations today or yesterday about um, 
uh, building a mixing proxy that will sit in front of an HA setup to do all the, the gap filling problems uh, in an HA setup that people have uh, complained about for a long time. So if anybody uh, is interested in working on that as a feature, we should start a thread on the Prometheus developers list about uh, creating a mixing proxy for HA setups. Yeah. That'd be amazing, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately also Tricky, semantically. Yeah, it's very tricky. But... So as you said, you have to do it separately for every single metric. Yeah. Like, for instance, for a quantile, if it's 95th percentile, you probably want a max. If it's the 5th percentile, you probably want a min. If it's the median, what are you trying to do? It's probably a max? Yeah, and, yeah, it's fun. Yeah.